welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. I hope you had a relaxing weekend, and I wish you all a productive week ahead. We begin this week by looking at Chinese energy security and policy developments. China, of course, is heavily dependent on imported energy, especially oil from the Middle East. Indeed, China is the world's biggest oil importer, sourcing more than 70% of its supply from overseas, compared with less than 10% at the turn of the millennium. Since the outbreak of the war in Ukraine and the West's Collective sanctions on Moscow. Beijing has become especially concerned about this deep strategic vulnerability. Japan, India, and of course the United States are all potential hostile powers with the capacity to intercept oil shipments coming from the Persian Gulf. In the event of a crisis, China has been in the process of mitigating this risk as much as possible. Though we note that there are limited avenues available to the massive oil importer in achieving this end. One option is to increase oil drilling closer to home. Currently, the country is working on building and deploying massive deep water drilling platforms. Off the coast from Macau in southern China lies a concrete expanse the size of Monaco. This facility, which houses over 15,000 workers at any given time, is making production platforms to be deployed in China's offshore oil fields. Quote, With significant untapped volumes offshore China. Domestic offshore barrels are expected to become an indispensable growth engine for the coming decade. Technology progress and increased access have enabled more drilling to be focused into deeper waters. End quote. China National Offshore Oil Corporation, the state-owned giant leading these Chinese efforts at deep sea drilling, expects to produce between 650 million and 660 million barrels of oil equivalent this year. However, even if these technologically and environmentally challenging drilling operations bear fruit, this is not enough to significantly reduce Chinese foreign energy reliance. Another policy push is looking back on an older and dirtier technology. According to a new report published this week by Netherlands-based group Greenpeace, China approved more than 50 gigawatts of new coal power in the first half of 2023. Gao Yuhe, who led the research in the report, expressed with its publication, "Quote: China's government has put energy security and energy transition at odds with one another. Beijing has clearly stated that coal power will still grow at a reasonable pace." Into 2030, in quote, power cut incidents and hydropower generation issues, especially in the south, over the last few winters, have pushed Beijing to prioritize energy security and reliable energy production over lofty environmental promises made by leadership to the international community in recent years. Coal output in China surged nine percent to 4.5 billion tons last year, more than half the world's total. In March, the powerful National Development and Reform Commission said China would quote strengthen coal's supporting role in the overall energy mix. In quote, officially, many of these new coal-fired power plants are designed to only act as backup sources behind wind, solar, and hydro. However, analysts argue that this will not necessarily be the case. According to think tank Global Energy Monitor, China has built more than 1,000 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity from 2000 through 2022, enough to power the entire European Union, and amounting to 69% of the global total additions during the period. Not all of China's investments are in coal and oil, however. At an energy storage forum. Held in Xi'an, central China, last week, the chairman of the China Energy Storage Alliance told the audience that China is projected to install 15 gigawatts to 20 gigawatts of power storage capacity in 2023, exceeding the total amount added in the last decade. Local governments have been requiring installers of renewables to equip their projects with energy storage facilities, in a bid to ensure a steady supply of electricity. 
Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin writes that Beijing has released 19 related policies in the first six months of this year regarding energy pricing models and facility safety regulations and has been promoting the use of power storage in projects including energy vehicle charging infrastructure and distributed solar power to facilitate the rollout of nationwide energy storage projects. Lithium prices have fallen by almost a third in the first half of this year too, compared with average prices last year, and this in turn has sped up installation of power storage systems. The China Energy Storage Alliance chairman also said that China's production of power storage batteries has tripled year on year to 75 gigawatts in the first six months, more than half being exported to meet overseas demand. And there is one more energy storage we need to discuss too. Last week, China's state council approved six new nuclear reactors, part of China's renewed push for more atomic energy projects. State-run The Paper reports that two units each were approved for Shandong, Fujian and Liaoning with a total estimated investment of 120 billion yuan, 17 billion US dollars. China began approving new reactors again after halting for several years amid safety reviews in the wake of Japan's Fukushima nuclear disaster, benefiting uranium prices, which have more than doubled since 2019. According to the World Nuclear Association, China has the world's third largest nuclear fleet behind France and the US and accounts for 23 of the 55 reactors currently under construction globally. Of course, this is all part of a wider global period and trend of tremendous political, social and energy transformation. Europe has had to engage in the largest energy shift in generations and at a continental scale, accelerating nuclear power investment. And as we have now seen, China continues in its massive push for more nuclear power too. But where most of the seismic changes are happening is in North America. Back in the 1990s, laws and regulations heavily restricted U.S. uranium exploration and mining. Today, the U.S.'s domestic uranium industry is limited to just one remaining commercial enrichment in New Mexico. However, incredibly, the U.S. is the largest consumer of uranium in the world, a trend set to continue. Now, Washington has bipartisan consensus to remove these restrictions. Bringing back uranium supply chains to North America is a national security priority. With surging demand from Europe, China and the United States, uranium has entered a bull market. Prices have already more than doubled, so the trend is very much strong and set to continue. And today's video sponsor, Traction Uranium, ticker symbol TRCTF, provides investors with an incredible opportunity to take advantage of this historic shift. The company is in the business of mineral exploration and the development of Discovery Prospects in Canada, the world's second largest uranium producer. Traction is exploring its two uranium deposits in the locations of the Athabasca Basin of Saskatchewan at Key Lake South and Hearty Bay, both in the heart of the world's most productive uranium mining districts. This place is called the Saudi Arabia of uranium, with about 20 times the average international purity. Indeed, Traction's technical advisor, Bowen Tan, a legend in the industry was instrumental in the discovery of this deposit back in 1975, so they know what they are doing there. As Washington brings supply chains back to North America, it is here where the action will be, because currently there is no other known location on the continent that can meet the massive US demand. 55% of the company is owned by the founders and strategic partners. This is a very tight structure of investors who believe in the company and the founders have skin in the game. Thus, Traction has a great location, excellent leadership and solid demand. Everything is ready and they will begin drilling soon. This is where the opportunity is for investors. The opportunity here is to build a position with the company before any drilling happens. The market currently has the company priced modestly. If drilling proves successful with positive uranium, then the stock will surge as the market reprices it and investors pour in. This is thus a speculation of sorts, some risk, 
but also the real possibility of very high returns. As such, for those investors looking for these types of opportunities, Traction Uranium could make an excellent addition to a well-diversified portfolio. And now is the time. So, if you want to take advantage of these historic geopolitical market and energy shifts, Traction Uranium is an extremely exciting company to look into. We remember that all investment involves risk. This is not individual investment advice. Always speak to an investment professional before making any investment decision. A massive thank you to Traction Uranium for sponsoring this episode of China Update. Okay, now moving back into regular content. Let's end today's video by discussing how the markets are looking at recent moves in the Chinese stock market. We remember that in July, key indexes in China and Hong Kong kept their best month since January after the powerful Politburo signaled more support for real estate, consumption and capital markets. We covered all of this in depth last week. However, long-only managers continue to sell stocks in China and Hong Kong on a net basis in July despite this sharp rally. Morgan Stanley, in a recent investor note, advised clients to take profits on the recent rally, downgrading China to equal weight. In the note, the U.S. bank expressed, quote, We believe investor confidence and conviction level are still very fragile, end quote. And, quote, The July Politburo meeting signaled policy easing, but key issues including local government financing vehicle debt, the property and labor markets, and the geopolitical situation need to improve significantly, in our view, for sustainable inflows and further re-rating. End quote. Others share this sentiment. Quote, we have seen this before. Strong rally, not holding up. I don't think most global funds are really buying into China in any meaningful way yet. End quote. Some investors still may be tempted by what may appear to be underpriced assets, however. The MSCI China Index is priced at less than 11 times forward one-year ratings, below its five-year average multiple of over 12 times, and valued at a 14% discount versus the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. The question is whether this will be cheap enough to cover uncertainties which are difficult to quantify and price in. Meanwhile, a beneficiary of investor concerns about China's economic growth and geopolitical tensions is China's other largest stock market, Japan. According to a Goldman Sachs report, foreign buying of Japanese equities have exceeded that of Chinese peers for the first time since 2017. Quote, there are two main policy events in Asia in the last week of July, the Bank of China meeting and the Politburo meeting, none of which change our view of Japan equities outperforming China. The reason is that we get increasing signs that the monetary policy normalization in Japan is going to be extremely gradual, which means the yen is not rapidly reappreciating. End quote. Asia-focused fund Alliance Oriental Income, with over a billion US dollars in assets, is five times more exposed to Japanese equities than Chinese. The MSCI gauge of Japan stocks is up 21% this year to date, while the MSCI China index is up just 0.5% for the year. Some investors see the very same geopolitical tensions that are making Chinese assets less attractive as being a good reason to pour into Japanese equities. Quote, Japan is the third largest economy in the world, and therefore having some exposure in an investment portfolio has a lot of merits. Japan is well placed to benefit from some of the geopolitical tension in the region through the diversification of supply chains. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Monday, and I will see you all tomorrow.